So we're going over our scripture reading today, which is Mark 10, 2 through 16, I believe. So let's start by reading that. Mark 10, 2 through 16. <clears throat> and the Pharisees came, I'm sorry, and the Pharisees came up and in order to test him, asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment to you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God is joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, as we come to your text today, um, uh, there was clearly some, some dispute, and, and the Pharisees were trying to trap you, Lord, and your wisdom reigns supreme. And we pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you would give us wisdom, give us direction, call us closer to you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, draw us near, open our ears to hear what you have to say this morning. Speak clearly through me, Lord, let my words be uh, silent and, if, and, and fall on deaf ears and let your words uh, only be received through open ears, Jesus, amen. So this was a good opportunity for me to, uh, this would have been a good opportunity for me to uh, uh, talk about marriage again, and we did the marriage series. I guess that was, I can't remember, I should have looked it up, um, earlier this year, it was like 26 weeks I did a marriage and child rearing series, and Josiah just did a, sh a little shorter series on effective child rearing, and this would be an easy intro to just talk about marriage again and the patterns for marriage and everything, and I decided I got to find a way to not talk about marriage the whole time. Uh, not that it would be bad, it's not, it's not going to be, it wouldn't be a bad thing to, to relay the foundations and, and, and just in our lectionary um, what, what our Lord is, is talking about, but um, it's obviously an important topic, marriage being the foundation and, and cornerstone of society and um, and as Jesus goes on here to, to bless children, I think there's a, a clear correlation there, um, in, at least in this gospel with, <coughs> excuse me, with him bringing children there. But there's a couple things I want to get after here today. Um, number one, I'll just say this, I'll say what I'm trying to convey, so if you don't get it, you just heard it now, and it doesn't matter what I say, just get the point. You might be able to zone out if you want. Uh, number one is, if unless the Lord opens your mind to understand the scriptures, you just won't get it. You'll be confused, you'll argue about different points, um, and you just can't understand the scriptures unless God opens your eyes, and by what I would call supernatural revelation, you will not understand the scriptures rightly, even though they're plain Everybody could read it, and the meaning is, uh, and, and just for the totality of Scripture, it's, it's clear, it's, it's not hidden, it's not mystical, but unless God opens your eyes, you just won't get it. Uh, and secondly, that this law that we're going to reference in, in Deuteronomy 24 that, that they're talking about uh, is the law was given, and what I want to explain why Jesus says it's because of the hardness of their heart. And so, <clears throat> whichever one I want to start, let's, 
Uh, so the Pharisees were coming to him, and as clearly it says it's a trap. This is another trying, this is another instance where the Pharisees are coming and laying a question before Jesus, and they're trying to trap him. It says that very clearly in, in uh, verse 2, or trying to test him. And so it doesn't say what the test is. It doesn't say what the trap is. Uh, there's really one of two uh, tests that it could be if it was more of a trap to get him arrested. This was in... Uh, this was in the region where, uh, where John the Baptist was preaching on the illegitimate divorce and marriage of his sister-in-law, uh, Heroditus, and, and everybody. And, and we get that uh, text in, in the Synoptic Gospels. And so they could have been laying this before Jesus for him to be talking about divorce in front of of, or in a public place where the Roman um, uh, tetrarchs and, and rulers would have been hearing this or would, would have gotten back to them and, and there would have maybe started an opposition against Jesus to get him arrested. Uh, that, is, that is kind of likely. I don't really think so. and um, It just doesn't give any... I, it, it could have been the possibility. It just doesn't seem likely to me. What I think seems more likely is is just like when the Sadducees were presenting Jesus about the resurrection to try to, to try to trap him on a theological issue, and there was a debate in first century Judaism on the resurrection and angels and demons and all this other stuff that we still debate about today. In Christianity, there was this uh, debate in Judaism, and there's always going to be a conservative side. We call that the right-leaning, and there's going to be the uh, liberal side, the left leaning, and so concerning divorce in first century Judaism, there was two camps. And when he asks, <coughs> when they ask him about divorce, they're referencing Deuteronomy twenty four. Uh, verses 1 through 4. It says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in, in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house... Or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. And for this is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. So this is not a law about whether you can or cannot divorce your wife. What is instituted in through Moses is that if... There is some kind of, um, we'll have to define it because there's the liberal and conservative view in first century Judaism. It says if there's any uncleanliness and she doesn't seem pleasing in, in his eyes, then he can divorce her. And so that gives the precedent for a, writing a certificate of divorce. But clearly, the law is about that same person coming back to remarriage. So they're not arguing about that because that's clear in the text of Scripture. Through Moses, they're not arguing whether one man can divorce his wife uh, and then get remarried to another woman, or that woman gets remarried and then she maybe her that husband dies, husband two dies, and then this man can come back or not, or if or if uh, for whatever reason that man divorces wife, uh, and that's husband number two divorces her, and then husband number one can come back and swoop in. The law is clear about that in Moses. They're not arguing about that. Uh, but what the law doesn't say clearly or start listing and enumerating reasons why a man can divorce his wife. The, uh, the, let's go to the conservative side was the house of Shammai. And there was uh, two schools or two camps in first century uh, Israel when, when this question was being presented. Uh, there's a little bit of a lore. There's, there was two Jewish camps. There's Shammai, which is the conservative camp, and there's Hillel, which is the liberal camp. 
and they were in the first century BC, and there's a little bit of a lore that says that uh, Jesus might have been taught by Hillel at some time. There's no proof of that. Uh, that's a little bit of a lore, but the uh, Hillel was very... Um, if you look at now, there's even still Hillel schools and, and Jewish things, and I'm not sure about Shammai, but I don't look into the one person that has any Jewish heritage, throwing her hands up uh, for more information. But, but I've never heard of any school of Shammai still existing, uh, but there certainly is uh, conservative and, and liberal camps, and there always will be. There's just always going to be liberal and conservative camps uh, when it comes to theology, when it comes to politics, when it comes to discipline in the home, when it comes to how much uh, sauce you're going to eat with your food or how much, how much spices, it's always going to be more liberal or conservative. And there's, you got a question about sauce? No, I'm not saying, <laughs> always do this to me. Go for it, sorry. Yeah, so uh, the conservative camp, Shammai, they were very conservative, and they thought that text, Deuteronomy 24, says that the uncleanliness only applies to adultery. And so, yeah, yeah, sorry. I kind of skipped ahead of that. I got too interested in the sauces. Do whatever you want. Well... That, that is actually kind of true. And so the Hillel side said that that uncleanliness applies to anything, or it could apply to anything. And that's not just a sexual immorality. That's uh, if he fell out of love with her. There are, have you ever heard the, um, there was like a, a, a Christian thing out there that says, we've heard in Jewish cultures that they could divorce for like any reason, like if they burnt their toast. Has anybody ever heard that? Yeah, that's because Hillel, uh, there's actually, you could look this up and there's writings from Hillel that says if she burnt the bread or baked bread and it burnt or, and he lists a whole, enumerates a whole bunch of things that are like way on the liberal side. Like way, like, like literally if she burns the bread and he doesn't find her pleasing, the scriptures allow that he's a, now, she hasn't found favor in his eyes so that he can get a divorce. And so the Hillel camp, the liberal camp, says you can divorce for just about any reason. And the Shammai side, the conservative side, said uh, you can only divorce for sexual immorality. And, um, and you can, in the debate, and go in between. And uh, I don't really want to go into the text, but it seems to be for some other reason because of the law. And the conservative side would equate, there's already laws about adultery. If your wife commits adultery, then stone her. Or if the husband commits adultery, stone him. There's already laws in Deuteronomy and Leviticus about adultery. So that's why there was this debate about, well, it, the conservatives have saying that this uncleanliness is just equating to adultery or some sexual immorality that he finds. Don't you think that he was just proposing Jesus' eyes? Jesus said legally you can't be adultery. It could be that they... Uh, believe that Jesus was conceived in adultery or something. It could have been. It could have been. Uh, it was a test, right? And and so I'm going to poke everybody in the eye here in a minute. Uh, I hope. Uh, and so we, the debate, and what it seems to me the best fits this is that they were presenting this test to him on this theological debate. Choose a side, left or right, left or right. Which one is it? And Jesus doesn't choose a side. <laughs> what he says, essentially, is you don't understand the scriptures. You didn't get it. It's not about, you're not supposed to look at this law that Moses gave and say, how far can I go in getting divorced? Where's the line? I think that is a, a natural tendency of us. I think when you look at the commands in scripture and it says, thou shalt not steal, and you're like, well, did I do this and steal? Well, maybe I did. And, and you should be pressing that into the corners. You should be asking yourself those types of questions. Uh, but it doesn't seem that they wanted to, that there was a test, so they didn't want a real answer. This was a, as a choose the side. And 
And so uh, I would equate this to, I'm going to poke everybody in the eye. You guys ready? I would equate this to, are you pro-life or pro-choice? And everyone's like, well, I'm, I hope everyone in the room was like, I'm, I'm pro-life. Well, what do you mean? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Because I just want to poke everybody in the eye. That's all I want to do. Yeah. And, uh, and so, in a, and I don't, and so I'm going to define those because most evangelical conservatives, and even when you talk about theological debates, uh, liberalism leads you away from Christ. It really does. But, conservatism can also lead you away from Christ because you're all about just getting the doctrine right or you're, you're straining out uh, a gnat and swallowing a camel. And so we get these either ors and we get, we get trapped in these. And so when I talk about pro-life or pro-choice or you could, uh, the reason I didn't say pro-life and pro-death is because in a political sense, if I was talking about who I'm going to vote for, or something, which I'm not going to talk about who I'm going to vote for. I'll poke you guys in the eye another day. I'll save one eye for next week. and Because uh, <laughs> then how you guys, then you guys will just have to listen and not see. But, but in a political sense, do you want to vote for a, a left-leaning... I'm not talking about on a, on a national, but I'm not talking about the presidential debates, by the way. I'm just talking the, theoretical. Do you want to vote for a pro-choice person who would believe in a more liberal approach to a woman's choice uh, to murder her baby up until maybe conception? Or do you want to vote for someone who's going to make up ex- exceptions who said you can murder your baby up to eight weeks? Or you can murder your baby up until we detect a heart, heartbeat? Or you can murder your baby if they were conceived in rape. And so that's why I wanted to poke you guys in the eye. Because either side is, I believe all life should be equal. I believe the Bible points that there should be no exceptions. That all life is special from God. That everybody, every, every child in the womb deserves equal rights as everybody else. And so that's why I would equate it in that sense to our our modern left and right. And so, coming back to the text, uh, when when he's presented with this, our Lord's like, it's not a a left or right. It's not a yes or no on here. And and what he references is the pattern for marriages. It's, do you understand that Moses put this here because you guys have hard hearts? This law was put in place because for whatever reason, you couldn't get along with your wife, or even if there was some sexual immorality, you couldn't forgive her and work it out if she wanted to stay, or whatever. Do you understand? Or, or just because, even if there was sexual immorality, that there's hardness of heart and there's sin there. Do you understand that God put this here, he put this commandment here, because your hearts are hard? And they're like, wait a minute, it's, uh, you didn't really answer our question, Jesus. Would you please just uh, stick to the debate? And he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And, <clears throat> and so he goes back and says it wasn't so from the beginning. When God created the universe and spoke everything out of existence, he created man and woman uh, uh, perfect in relationship, and there was no sin, and they became one flesh. And he says... That's your pattern. They became one. Don't separate what God has God put together. And so uh, he doesn't say it in this text, but in, in, in Mark, Mark's gospel he doesn't say it, but I believe in, it's in Matthew's he says it. I don't think he says it in, in Luke's. So you guys can look and find out. But he says, he adds the, uh, whoever divorces her wife, divorces his wife except for sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery or he commits adultery against her and so I personally read scripture and see that there's two grounds for adultery which is sexual morality and, and if the unbeliever leaves and uh, answers what did I say 
Oh, there's no reasons for adultery. <laughs> there's zero reasons for adultery. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Shout that out. Heresy. <laughs> Foolish. Get off the stage. <laughs> there's no reasons for adultery. <laughs> zero. Don't, don't cut this part out. This is... <laughs> Uh, cut the last part out. There's no reasons for adultery. There's, I see there's biblically two reasons for divorce, which is sexual morality and if the unbeliever leaves, but that is allowed because of hardness of heart and because there's sin in the world. And so the law in Galatians uh, 2 tells us that the law is our tutor to lead us to Christ. And so this law that we have in Deuteronomy and, and throughout Scripture uh, is, is meant to reveal to us, first and foremost, our sin. That we need, that we do not meet the standards. That we need a Savior, we need, uh, we always need help and grace. And secondly, what I believe is, because we're just talking about this Deuteronomy passage about divorce, is secondly, the purpose of the law is, is to restrain evil. And so, the first purpose is to reveal our sinful hearts and our need for a Savior and a Redeemer. And secondly, it's to restrain evil. And so especially in the civil sense, in the civic sense, that I am happy that we have laws that are uh, more godly and, and the laws should be based on, on God's law to restrain evil. I'm glad that uh, we have speed bumps well, I'm, I'm not glad when I need to go faster, but I'm glad we have speed bumps. I've got two on my road, and there's a four-way intersection, and they're all around the intersection because we've got kids on the street, and I'm glad there aren't people zooming by at 70 miles an hour uh, in front of our house when there's kids out there playing because it's put there to restrain, restrain people. And, uh, and this is a law on the books that was in Deuteronomy, I believe, and it restrained evil. It stopped men from... Uh, tossing the, and saying, ah, she burnt the toast or whatever, uh, to just divorce her and then go find someone else and then divorce her and then go come back to the first one and marry her and then probably divorce her again because she's still burning the toast. and Because and, it wasn't about how far can you go. It was about, uh, I believe that, that was more about protecting women because if you read in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 24, there's other laws for marriage and it's all about protecting the woman in, in society and not about, uh, how far you can go in, in your sin. And so, um, and so that when our Lord puts these laws here and you see them and you read them and the whole, what, uh, what John 16-ish, somewhere in that chapter, uh, talks about that the Holy Spirit comes to convict of sin. And so when we read Scripture, when we, when we read things like this, when we read the, the Gospels and we see Jesus' teachings and we see what the, how the apostles applied it, it's our, it's our tutor to come and convict us of sin. And we apply it in our, in our families and our marriages to our kids and, and in society, as we can reasonably do, uh, to, to restrain evil. But the Pharisees didn't get any of that. They didn't come and ask Jesus what he thought because they wanted his wisdom or they wanted instruction. They, they were there to test him. And it shows that they had no understanding of the scriptures. And ultimately, because, uh, and we find that the Pharisees never repented and because uh, it had never, they were caught in this debate and there really was a huge debate around this in, in the first century B.C., uh, about 50 to 75 years before Jesus was born, there was a huge debate around this, and there was uh, beginning to be a divide in Judaism, um, as there always is in religious sects and political sects and whatever, and any ideology around conservative or, or liberal, but they just didn't get it. They weren't reading this and saying, how can I know God better? How can I, how can I be filled with his spirit? How can I obey better. They were both using it to see how far can I go. Because unless God opens our eyes, we just won't understand it. We just won't get it. We can, have you guys ever, um, 
If you guys ever maybe been a while, maybe you actively thought this, or maybe you've been diligent to uh, read your scriptures every day, and you do your devotionals, and you're just like, man, it's been a while since, like, God showed me something. It's been a while since I've, like, read scripture. I've been reading it every day, but I've, it's been a while since I've read it, and it's, like, really impacted me. And I'm not saying that you should stop reading your Bible or that you shouldn't do your daily devotions, but I think we've all witnessed uh, something like that or, or gone through something like that. And, and yeah, there's the deceitfulness of sin, and, yes, uh, sometimes we can just get into doing the motions, and, yes, there's our... Um, we bring our own flesh to it. And sometimes it's like, oh, I've read that and I got the same thing out of it. And it's like, uh, I, want something, I want something new. I want, some, I want some fresh water from the Lord I've been reading and uh, I just haven't been like, kapow! Like, there it is. That's what I've been waiting for. Like, I want my eyes open more, right? Uh, the psalmist says, like, like, show me wonderful things in your law. Not let me read and let me find it and let me understand it and let me... Uh, uh, let me find it through my own reasoning and my own efforts. Surely to find it, you have to put in effort. So don't, don't catch me uh, wrong on that one. You have to have your, uh, a discipline of reading Scripture because the Lord just won't show you anything in Scripture and you won't open your eyes unless you're reading Scripture. And, uh, but there is this awesome thing that happens when we get in the scriptures and, and the Lord decides, like, you've read the same thing, like, a hundred times. You've read it, you know, maybe, maybe you've read the Gospels, uh, or let's just talk about Mark or something. You've read Mark a hundred times, and, and you read it again, and this little word jumps out, and you're like, oh, I've never thought about that. Well, that's the Holy Spirit opening the eyes of your heart to see something that you should have seen that was there the whole time that you've read a hundred times. And now he's like, let me show you something else. <laughs> By the way, I think you're ready. Let me, let me give you this little nugget. I love you. Here you go. And um, one of the great things I got uh, out from our conference that was on prophetic gifts and some other things is uh, just a clear explanation. And, and I think we all kind of, we, we get this, just but to say it out loud is like, Sometimes when we read scripture and we want God to show us something, it's going to come through like what we thought. It's going to sound like our thoughts. It's going to sound like, oh, I never thought about that. And I just thought about that. And yeah, you did because that's how the Holy Spirit works. He speaks through you and it's going to, um, it's often this faint and, and, and quiet voice, but uh, oftentimes powerful, but it sounds like your own thoughts and you, and you read something in scripture and it's just like, kapow, it hits you. And you're like, oh, I never thought about that. And I just thought about that. And you didn't do it through your own, uh, your own diligence and your own, own actions. It's the Holy Spirit revealing scripture to you and opening your eyes to something he wants to show you uh, because he loves you. And that's, that's just how, how God works. Uh, in, in Luke 24, we won't uh, turn there and read the passage, but I think we all are familiar with it when after Jesus' resurrection and it's on the road to Emmaus, the two disciples are, are heading back, <coughs> heading back, and they seem kind of distraught. They're heading um, uh, away from Jerusalem, and uh, Jesus meets them on the road, and they don't, uh, they don't recognize him. They don't see him. They don't understand that that's Jesus. Um, and they're walking and they're discussing, like, don't you know what happened? Like, all these things that happened to Jesus, this prophet, this guy that came and did all these miracles, and then he, he was crucified, and he said he was going to be raised in three days, and some people said that he was, and these women, who knows? <laughs> like, it's crazy. I heard there was a miracle, but it's these, <laughs> it's these weird people, and uh, I don't know. And, uh, and Jesus goes on to explain them how the entire scripture was about them, starting with the law of Moses and who knows how long they walked? I don't. I would assume that would take a couple hours, whatever. But they're walking, and Jesus is explaining their explaining the scriptures to them in a way that they've never understand before. And it says because Jesus opened the scripture, opened their minds to understand the scriptures, because that's how it always works. It has always worked that way. The, these Pharisees didn't have their minds; they were nitpicking about and creating this 
this divide and, and chasm, that's not even what it was about. It wasn't even about that. They should have been saying, like, hey, how, given this law on divorce, how could we seek the Christ more fully, and how could we live in respect to God's original plan for marriage, and how can we honor God more? Not like, how far can we go? And so Jesus on the road to Emmaus opens their eyes to understand the scriptures, and, and they see, like for the first time, that all of the scriptures were about this Jesus, about this guy that they had walked with for three, three and a half years, had been crucified, and then, uh, it, and then resurrected. And then they're like, oh, this is Jesus. Like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> like, like I, I'm pretty sure he like looked the same. I'm always going to wonder that. It's like, what were they like? Did they see a guy that looked exactly like Jesus as they saw him in the flesh? And they're like, yeah, a lot of people look similar. Yeah, <laughs> that's weird. Uh, and then like, oh, it was really dumb. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> like, that's, that's crazy. Uh, I don't know. Uh, side, side point. I wonder what Jesus looked like on the road to Emmaus. You guys can meditate on that later. But, <clears throat> but really, that's what we should be seeking. And, and I think a lot of times I fall into this, and this is just a, a warning against getting into patterns and cycles. Like when we read, like we ought to be reading the Scriptures. The Lord will not speak to us through the Scriptures, through the Holy Spirit, very clearly without knowing the Scriptures. We ought to have daily time in the Word. But are we saying, like, like Jesus, like let me meet you at your feet today? When I get up and I'm tired and I know I've only got 15 minutes to read before, like, the baby gets really active and then, like, my other kids want something and then I have to go to work and then I have to figure out when I'm going to eat breakfast and how to do life today. Am I saying, am I, am I getting up and saying, I got to get my 15 minutes in because I got to read and I got to get something and if I don't, then I'm a poor Christian and no, I was already a poor Christian, uh, but... But or am I saying like like Jesus like show me yourself like reveal yourself to me like come like in this powerful way and it might not just be a kapow like oh I didn't notice that word or I or I, I didn't know that was that in Greek but are are we coming to the scriptures to say this is time with Jesus this is meeting him at his feet Holy Spirit please open my eyes if I don't I'm lost I'm doing I can't. God won't, uh, what you don't put in, God can't take out, in a sense. In this sense, right? God's not going to reveal things to you. He's not going to meet with you in the scriptures if you're not opening your Bible and reading. But are we simultaneously crying out and saying, like, Jesus, like, come, heal me. Give me a word. What do I need to know today? I don't know what's going to happen today. I know I'm going to work. I know my kids are going to be unruly. I know this. I know a lot of things. I can bank on it. But what do I need, right? And just to kind of end with uh, uh, what I think is a, a common testimony in a normal way God works, but you won't read it in the Bible, is, is have you ever guys, uh, well, whatever the context to be, this happens to me often when, this is how the Lord moves in my life often when I just kind of go like a dry spell or something, or I'm going through a hard time, or it's been especially anxious, or, or worrisome, or I'm worried about something in particular, and I'm just doing my daily Bible reading, and I'm just like, I didn't pick out a specific, I'm not going, oh, don't be anxious, cast your anxiety is upon the Lord, I know that Bible verse. Um, you just like read the Bible regularly, and you come across something that is like very specific to your life for that day, or that time period, and you didn't do a topical Bible verse on whatever that trouble is. It's just that it came across, God ordained it and provided it for you in your daily reading. Like that's God moves in sometimes what seems to be simple ordained ways of, well, he knew I was going to be in Mark chapter 17. That was a joke. There's no Mark 17. Uh, <laughs> so... You guys should read your Bibles more <laughs> and look at the chapters and what they're numbered, uh, right? It's like he didn't know I was going to be in Mark 16 or whatever, and, and or I'm sorry, he did know. He knew I was going to be there. Uh, he knew the troubles I was going to be. Yeah, I, I, 
<laughs> I should write more notes. <laughs> Go ahead, Deanna. I wasn't talking about verse 14 at all, but the first verse 14 applies to that. Praise God. Look at how God's moving. Yeah. Yeah. That's how the Holy Spirit moves. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I actually, in my reading, I forgot that 13 through 16. Actually, as I was preparing, I forgot that 13 through 16 was there, so I didn't read it all week. <laughs> I didn't even think I was going to preach on it. I, I could have just fooled you guys in the bulletin. Uh, but yeah, go ahead, John. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's because we, you know, the all scripture is breathed out by God and sufficient for us. It's all in here already, but I also need new revelation of what was already written, like constantly, because uh, number one, I can't read this all every day and memorize it and apply it, and uh, nor could I even go through a topical list of studies, but it's all here already, but I also need the Holy Spirit to come and and, and reveal it to me at the same time. And so sometimes we get into, like, I really do cry out and say, like, I need, like, I need something from you, Lord. And it's like, I didn't, he didn't answer my prayer that day. It's like, well, yeah, examine yourself. Uh, see if there's any wrong motives in your heart. Uh, sometimes I'm like, Lord, give me fresh revelation that I could take to my wife. <laughs> I could show her uh, why I don't need to do the dishes. Uh, or something, uh, you know, and, and, and sometimes there is just like a, well, I'm, you're not ready. Say that again. For, for her. That. <laughs> oh, man. I'm sure I could, I'm sure I could do something to negate that. <laughs> I you. I'm going to have to think about washing the dishes now. <laughs> Better. Or without complaining. I don't know. Is that a word from the Lord? <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so we, we need to come daily, and, and it's all here already, but the Pharisees didn't get it. Those Pharisees didn't get it. They just wanted to use it as a, as a mode to uh, pick a side and divide. And, and, and what I'm just reminding us of or, or warning us of is, Number one, going through our, our daily readings or, or being really disciplined people, but not sitting at Jesus' feet. And I guess the other warning would be when we're reading Scripture, I guess this is like all in the same, when we're reading Scripture, you know, we, even when we, we read Scripture and there's certain directives and commands, don't do this, do this. We ought to not do those things and do those things we ought to do. But do we view it through the lens of, because I've met with Jesus, I can be empowered by his spirit to now go and do these things. Or is it the law that crushes us, that is meant to crush us, to reveal our sin, to push us towards Christ? So let's pray. Lord, Lord we come to you this morning before we worship that you would just purif purify us, cleanse us, Lord. Wash our, our minds of any... Um,
And anybody who who will show up for worship here this morning, Lord, and who is worshiping online, that you'd wash our minds of just uh, wrongful thinkings, the wrong thinkings we had. Lord, refresh our minds. Show us fresh revelation through your scripture. Meet with us this morning by your Holy Spirit to worship you. And even as we come to worship, not just because the songs are on the screen, and that's what we do every Sunday, but with a powerful encounter, Lord, that Jesus, you are here. Let us sit at your feet and worship you as you would have us, Jesus. Amen.